I think you'd have to start talking about the potential for a license to practice architecture rather than just having the term architect. Episode 117. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I'm in the beautiful home, actually we're in the light shed, of Richard John Andrews, who is the owner of Richard John Andrews Limited, which is a practice which grew out of a self-build project, his home that we're actually conducting the interview in, uh, the Cork House, you might have seen beautiful images of it uh, on Instagram, and a collaboration with renowned artist Conrad Shaw. So this was a project that Richard had been working on uh, previously and the practice developed and grew out of these projects in a fairly unconventional manner in a way. Um, And I think this was one of the most interesting aspects of this conversation is um, talking to a designer like Richard of such calibre and design skill and expertise and hearing his unconventional route to becoming a practice owner was incredibly inspiring and also raises very pertinent questions over the limited routes or the limitations that there are into becoming a qualified architect which we begin to interrogate and Richard discusses his own story in a lot of depth. So sit back, relax and enjoy the brilliant Richard John Andrews. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work. But it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. So so tell me, how did you get into architecture then? Hmm. So architecture came from... I worked for three years... um, after leaving college, I worked for three years in sort of fashion retail. Uh, started to go and break in towards like visual merchandising, um, shop setups, and things like that. And uh, going away for like sort of two or three days to set up a new shop. Mm. Um, this, the, is, this is straight out of out of college. This was straight out of college, right. yeah, like eighteen. And so in in and around all of that, I also you know would help out on site with my dad's uh, company whenever he needed it or whenever I needed a bit of extra cash. So it was sort of like I'd work during the week and then I might have the weekend off but then like my dad might need some help or or he could help us out by giving us work basically. I mean he didn't need our help. (laughs) (laughs) It was like you just, uh, you can come to work and do some work for me and I'll pay you a day rate type thing over the weekend for like extra beer money, you know? Yeah, yeah. And um, so that's sort of like where my life was after college and, you know, just sort of going out with friends like four or five nights a week. Then the introduction of that we found out that on a Wednesday night there was uni night as well. It's crazy. Like then it turned into like six nights a week. (laughs) And so, so we literally just worked and just went out and worked and went out and worked and went out. And that revolved around sort of like Cambridge, Newmarket, Peterborough, St. Ives. Um, And around that sort of time when I was doing that, there was a massive culture because the local community is a boxing community. Mm. There's a massive culture of like fighting and stuff like that. So you'd always get like pulled into like altercations on a night out. And it was just, yeah, it was just, I mean, it was was fairly funny, but at the same time, sort of pretty concerning that like it did get to a point where you would see friends and 
every single time you'd chat to them about a night out they'd been on that they'd been started on or something like that. So it was uh, quite a weird one. So in and amongst all of that, just the working and the going out and all of those sorts of things, then I started to really think about taking visual merchandising further, mm. which then led into the idea of being a part of a team that would go and set up these shops. Um, and then from that, I started to do a bit more research about sort of like interior design, interior architecture, like the idea of creating uh, sort of like a set and things like this. And, and then so I sort of sat down with my mum, who's an art teacher, and sort of said, look, I'm just not really satisfied with where this is going. Like, I want to try and think about like bigger stuff, like, you know, thinking about like designing buildings, like bridges, those sorts of things. Mm. And so we just sat down and went through, um, you know, the standard sort of things, looking at different universities, what courses they offered, doing research into those courses. Um, and because because of all of the issues that happened at the regional college, my yeah. portfolio from my regional um, college was binned by the lecturer. He threw the whole thing out, which had all my fine art stuff, all my fashion stuff, no uh, 3D work, yeah. So in amongst doing that, I basically, this was six months before they had the cut-off period for acceptance to university. Right. Um, and... Uh, I was I signed up to do a CAD course for car design just in one day a weekend with one of my sort of sort of older friends and um we were going he was taking us to that like every weekend um and I did about sort of six six sort of sessions and then that sort of filtered into the idea that okay right so I can actually these are some of the programs that are being used by people that are doing architecture or interior design. Mm. So actually, like this is really good. Like I understand a little bit about CAD already, mm. and I understand a bit about construction, and I understand a bit about sort of interior design and I suppose what you class when you're younger as like artistic flair, right? Sort of like the idea of creating something new. And uh, obviously, my mum was hugely creative and still is. And um, and so then from that, I then was like, right, so I gave myself a deadline and I had to redo my whole portfolio in sort of four weeks of the summer before the deadline for applications. And then we just put it in. And obviously I was very, very aware that not a lot of people get through mm. without A-levels. Yeah. And obviously that the, there was no reference from any tutor or lecturer at their college that would have backed up what I'd done um, so it was very much just based on portfolio so I literally spent like four weeks with my mum just literally day in day out just like this is what you've got to do this is what you've got to do and uh, get it done and um, it ended up being really interesting actually it, it ranged from you know, recreating the album cover to like Limp Biscuits first album to like full on interior design, layout, design, textures, material palette and stuff of, you know, like a, a place within uh, Chatteris where I was living at the time. Mm. And um, and so then I just didn't think I'd hear anything. And then I got a call saying that I'd got an interview at Canterbury. Um, and I drove down in my lowered saxo <laughs> <laughs> with, with my parents, um, which obviously that was just hugely noisy, like couldn't speak to each other over the exhaust pipe. Um, and and just, uh, just straight pipe till... <laughs> yeah, yeah, just straight through, uh, just this straight through pipe on this lowered saxo <laughs> and uh, just trying to have a conversation about like how what questions I might be asked in an interview and how was I going to deal with like or justify why I didn't get my A-levels and things like this mm. and and I just that it just from then it was just there's some stupid stuff that I've done but I think I've just got to be honest about it because if I try and blag it or if I try and say like oh it was all because of this like I just think like they're just going to see through that so when I got to the interview I was just really honest like just now, I just told them exactly pretty much what had happened and and sort of where I'd gone wrong and and you know what what situation had occurred and and that seemed to be enough with my portfolio. So they offered me a place in the interview, yeah, um, for the course. And so I started out doing interior architecture, 
And within six months of doing interior architecture and watching the first crits that were happening with the architecture course that was running in parallel, um, I was just like, I went to the course leader and I was just like, oh, I'm really sorry, but I want, I want to go over onto architecture. I, I think that's better suited for me. Mm. So he was just like, yeah, not a problem. Like with what you're doing and, and your sort of grades so far, like that's absolutely fine. Um, so then I moved over into architecture, which was where I started my part one. Brilliant. Um, yeah. And, and, and since then you've had quite an interesting career. Like you've like, you know, you've been very proactive in terms of actually been involved in construction, building stuff. Yeah. What happened after, after your, during your degree then, and what kind of projects were you getting in, involved in early on? And, and you can kind of talk a little bit about how the Richard John Andrews, the, the business is how that's kind of was formed. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think, so from when I was at a degree level, um, I took on a sort of architectural apprenticeship or paid internship at a company called Doss Architects over in Lever Street. And, um, you know, that was really sort of influential in me understanding that, you know, an architecture practice doesn't have to be a thousand employees. Mm. It can be sort of five or six really key members that all have different skill sets and they work together and then that means that you can still compete with the bigger guys because it's just such a well-oiled machine and so the owners of that um Tavis and Lorenzo were just fantastic like they just uh, every time I had a question every time that I wanted to explore visualization you know they or model making or anything like that they would obviously just support it and um, I was just treated like a, a normal member of a team rather than an, a, like you know an intern or someone that doesn't have anything to offer. Yeah, uh, which was fantastic. So that was a really positive experience. And then, and then from that, I sort of felt quite empowered to try and get involved in other projects. And so um, there was a point, and I can't remember whether it was that summer or the summer between second year and third year, but at one point there was like a small project where. Uh, we took on like the sort of internal fit out or renovation of a stable block for some horses. Um, and that ranged from like just doing some sketch design work uh, to pricing the whole thing and then presenting one of my sort of um, my wife's uh, friend's mums with like this little proposal like we can do this, we'll do this for you. And she was like, fine. So we actually spent like me and my brother who I pulled into it because I was like, uh, it was too demanding for me to lay like I calculated the concrete to do the whole floor of the stables and stupidly I was just like yeah I'll be able to do it myself it's fine and um, then I realised when I was speaking to my dad he was just like you do realise that that's a lot <laughs> of concrete and I was just like but how much he was like is a lot and I said like, okay so I started calculating these things and started thinking well if there's if there's one guy and and there's no way that we can get this concrete lorry alongside the stables because it's too muddy and it's too wet so we can't do that so we can't use a chute um, we don't have the budget for a pump so we're gonna have to do it by wheelbarrow so I was like right okay that's that's 260 odd wheelbarrows full of concrete and I was just like okay no I can't do this on my own so I pulled my brother in who came and helped me um, and we were still there from like seven o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock at night just so, so, so this was a job that you were you were like involved in the construction you were involved in, yeah, the, in yeah. the design of it and kind of executing it as, yeah. a, as a part one essentially yeah but it was like a happy-go-lucky thing it was <laughs> like it was like we're we want to get a builder to come and do this yeah. Do you think you could do a nicer job uh, with a bit of design like within it? And if so, and it's competitive price, then obviously we'd prefer to give you the job because we know you and stuff like this and we trust you. So it was sort of like, it was very much like, yeah, okay, well, we'll let's give it a go type thing. And uh, so it was, it wasn't like a, how you'd say like, um, you know, a traditional architectural relationship where you sit down and you're like, what's your brief and what do you need and all of that. It was very much like, you know, she came to us and was just like, I want this flat. <laughs> it needs to be reinforced for the horses and I want some stables all the way down that side and all the way down that side. So it's like really, really sort of, uh, I wouldn't say like slapdash or anything like that, but it was just very sort of 
practical and like methodical in its approach. Yeah. Just this is what we need. There is no budget for like frills and spills. We don't need to consider anything else other than concrete because the fact is these horses will take down pretty much any wall that's and, not. <laughs> and, and, was, and was there a certain... Did you have any kind of people that you were asking upon for experience or like other yeah. architects that you were... That, that's quite... like That takes a lot of confidence for, yeah. for a young designer to take on any kind of building project. Yes, and, true. And, and, it, and it is really exciting to hear that you were just like, yeah, let's just... Let's just, let's just go for it. Let's go for it's it. Like all guns blazing type approach. Um, yeah, I think like, you know, I, I sort of... I briefly asked and, and sort of said to one of my lecturers and they were just like, look, you know, as long as you've got this planned, as long as you've taken into account things like contingency and, and um, you know, you're very honest and upfront with the client and if there's any problems, you identify them really early. Like if there's no, there's no contractual agreement other than like a very simple quotation, i.e. we'll do X for Y type approach, um, then there's nothing overly complicated that, potentially could put you in an, in, a, in an area of risk mm. um, or a position of risk. So based on that and also some help from my dad, who obviously is a, or was a developer at the time, um, yeah, there was a bit of experience that I felt, okay, well, you know, I know where to get concrete from. I know where to order blocks from. I know things like most of their deliveries because of the location will be road or curbside. So I know that, you know, I'm going to get really fit over the next two weeks <laughs> trying to do this. So, like, you know, that's another incentive, isn't it? You take on a building project before you go back to uni. It's like you're really in shape then. So you yeah. just, like, drink all summer and party and then you go back to uni and you're really in shape and then you spend all of uni just going out and doing work and, and sort of partying at the same time. So it's... Uh, it was it was a flawless like a flawless sort of proposal from me. It was like this is what we're going to do. So, I think that was you know that having the reinforcement from Electra and also having the reinforcement from my dad in terms of a little bit of extra construction knowledge. Yeah. Um, and also like networking. So the person that built the blockwork walls uh, was actually our neighbour who was a professional bricklayer. So I contracted him to come on and deliver X amount of linear meterage of blockwork wall at x price so mm. um it was yeah it was really sort of like oh i need him so i'll go and get him oh, i'll what, need this and i'll go and get this what i love about this as well is as as an experience is like you're kind of you know when it's intuitive like that and it's there's the kind of there's the sort of enthusiasm of youth and like yeah i'm just gonna go yeah, and, yeah. And, and do it and there's but you're also developing like entrepreneurial yeah, you know, you're cultivating a kind of entrepreneurial tendency, which obviously you naturally mm -hmm. have, yeah. and mixing that as well with construction logic. Yes, and okay. and then kind of like you know, how is this thing going to get built? How is it going to get? How's it? How's it going to cost? And you're kind of, you know, blurring the lines between being contractor, architect, yeah, designer, and you know, and and builder, and and working with the client in that way. Yeah, of course. So so when you went back to university, then that must have been quite a, a unique experience that kind of separated you from other students or what other students would, might have been doing yeah. what, what happened next in your in your part two and so then in my part two then yeah so when we went back to do um yeah when we when we went back to do my part two um yeah no sorry so yeah so at the end of part one after having that experience then i was like i felt like because i had the small scale experience that i could then start sort of aiming for bigger practices to try and work out what was going on there. So I decided to apply for fostering partners. Right. And I was like, right, so I've explored the smaller scale practice as an intern. I've done some work on site. Um, my project work was hugely conceptual, but sort of was a little bit grounded in some form of construction or detailing. Um, and so I need to go and see like, you know, the very sort of atmospheric approach of like someone big like you know foster and partners with a thousand employees and um so i actually applied but it was just after the recession so i was applying for jobs but i was well aware that people that were like part twos and architects were losing their jobs because they were the higher paid 
version of us, so to speak. Yeah. So I think when I joined, I think that Foster's was in a time where it may have let go a couple of hundred people right. um, over the course of a few months type thing. So I was sort of put into that environment in a small team um, that was uh, in charge of running or part of the team that was running a project over in Mumbai. So that just went from, yeah, being small scale design work, concept design work, being on site to then, you know, dealing with millions and millions of pounds worth of projects that you're ultimately responsible for contributing to, whether that's from, you know, 20 grand's worth of visualizations for a presentation or whether it's actually being in charge of doing a detail that then goes to get sign off or something like that it was just a hugely different experience but yeah. I felt quite confident and comfortable being in that environment because you know when when we were designing stuff like brick facades or when we were doing visualizations and we were looking at how you would create like a you know like a seamless balustrade or something like that I understood that there was an element of craftsmanship that went into it and we weren't going to solve it on our own Whereas like some people would be like, oh, well, I've modelled this and it, it just needs to be built like that because I've modelled it like that. Yeah. And so I just understood that there was a bit of a deeper level of understanding that you needed and the person that you were trying to communicate to needed in order to sort of um, finish that element of the build, which was which was quite interesting. And so when I was in that environment I think it was a baptism of fire I think like everyone says about going and working in big practices like that where you know you don't have much of a social life unless it's within the office environment <laughs> which, is, which is just like beers at four o'clock on a Friday because we know you're not going home until 3am like you know it's that sort of mentality um, which was just I, I you know I wouldn't change a lot about my experience from part one um, being in professional practice. I mean, you know, that went through uh, things like being signed off for like stress and anxiety for like six weeks mm. because I was overworked. Like, um, you know, being in a position where you've on one hand you've got like a really great team, lots of lovely people, all sort of striving to that one goal, but then on the other hand you've got like your own personal struggle, which is like. I've literally had like four hours sleep for the last week. And wow. so I think like when you look at it like that, it is a baptism of fire. And I wouldn't say it's healthy to look at it like a rite of passage. But I think that if you decide to put yourself in that environment, you can really understand, you know, what your body can take, what your mind can take and where your limitations are. And if you really throw yourself into it and don't hold back from it, then then that's what you get out of it, I mm. feel. And so you can then use that to then understand what you would do differently within business or within a practice. And so from Foster's really was where I started to understand what were the good things about Foster's, what were the bad things about the big practice, um, and then cross-reference that with like what were the good things about DOS architects and so on and so forth. And so that I think was really important for me is like understanding that I've got certain types of limitations, both physical and mental, when it comes to being involved in architecture. And I now know when I can push them and when I can't push them. And because of that, I can understand what I would want out of like a perfect practice for myself. Right. And so that whole experience was really sort of quite incredible, really. And uh, then moving from Foster's, I went and did six months at a practice that had between 35 and 50 people, which was a practice called Michaelis Boyd Associates over in Notting Hill Gate. And again, they were a fantastic architect's practice. Um, and there was a lot of pros, um, you know, but also I wasn't at my peak physical fitness because I'd just come from Foster's. So I was like, you know, it, it was becoming a bit of a test to even just sort of go through that process of, of, of uh, sort of being a part of projects and, mm. you know, putting in the extra hours because I was sort of a bit over it by that point. And so I don't think really Michaelis Boyd got sort of my full, they didn't get my full attention really. So the whole time I was there, I did feel a bit sort of like, well, I'm thinking about going back to do my part two and I've been out of university for nearly two years mm. 
and have gained an awful lot of experience in that two years that sort of wasn't really paralleled by some of the other guys that I'd studied with. Like a lot of the other guys that I'd studied with had gone into a small practice and just stayed in that small practice for a year, then gone straight back to uni. Um, and they were already sort of halfway through their course by the time I even sort of moved on from Foster's. And so there were a couple that delayed it like I did, which I think was a really good call for all of us. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and then sort of like, so at Foss, at uh, Michaelis Boyd, by already thinking about my part one and already happy with the level of experience that I got, um, or I'd had, then I decided to go back and do my part two. And I thought about going and doing it in London since though I lived here. Um, but then at the same time, I was like absolutely blown away with the way in which Canterbury, um, helped me in my part one and, you know, kept in contact with some people that were like the year below or the year above. And some of the lecturers were interested in what experience you were doing. So it just felt natural really to go Mm. and commute back down to Canterbury. Yeah. So whilst I was doing my part two, we lived, uh, me and my partner lived in Hackney and, and I drove down to Canterbury sort of once a week, which was fun. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. So, so it was kind of two years as a part one, gaining experience in Foster's, working in Michaelis Boyd. Yes. And it's really interesting what you just sort of shared about the kind of working culture and the sort of benefits. Mm. And what were some of the benefits of working yeah, like yeah. that? Because a lot of the time we hear... You know, uh, you know that kind of culture coming under a lot of criticism, and mm-hmm. you know, for rightly so, and it's you know, it can be very stressful for people. What do you think were some of the benefits of being in that kind of culture? I think the camaraderie is like one thing that is just like unparalleled. You can't like the fact that you are, you know, you're coming up with ideas together, you're eating together, you're dozing off <laughs> together. Uh, one person's, you know, giving you a shake because we've got a presentation in half an hour and you're just trying to just like, just catch a few little, (laughs) just a few little winks. Like it's that sort of environment that is just like really bonding. So there were a lot of good things about like the group of guys that I was working with. Um, that was amazing. Like, you know, and, uh, and we all really bonded about that, but obviously within that bonding, there's also uh, friction, right? So, you know, you'd have like the these sort of like arguments that would build over a period of time, and then when people were under an awful lot of pressure um, through deadlines that were set and stuff like that, then that's when they would sort of like boil over. Mm. And and so, but it just the benefits were that yeah, one like obviously the the camaraderie side of things, the teamwork, the speed at which you could generate ideas and present them and communicate them, like. You know, I, I'm not really of the sort of opinion that I think that endless options are a good way of designing something specific for a specific context. Uh, context. Um, but the amount of options and design work and sort of like the, just the rigour that you go through in the process like at Foster's was just incredible. Mm. Um, and it, I think it really it forms like how... Uh, successful you are at communicating your own ideas and it 100% when I went back to do my part two um, it helped me so much knowing that I could generate a certain model or a concept that then I could alter ever so slightly until I got to the point at which I felt like it couldn't be critiqued yeah Um, and so whereas you know with certain experiences of I've sort of seen from other people within the course and stuff like that, you know, they'd create a model and then take it in to be sort of critiqued by the lecturers. Like the approach that I learned from Foster's was that I'm going to create a model or create a design. Then I'm going to critique it, tweak it, critique it, tweak it all the way through that process until I feel like there's nothing that can Mm. be critiqued on it. It's a very rigorous process. Then I'm going to take it in and get someone else's opinion on it. Yeah, And then when I've got that opinion, I'm going to come back and then I'm going to make sure that I've addressed everything that that opinion holds. And if I can't, that there's a reason why. And I just think it's just that level of understanding and rigor like within that process. Yeah. Which was just, yeah, which was hugely beneficial. 
light. And and so that kind of launched you into into part two. You went back. Yeah. To, you went back to Canterbury. Went back to Canterbury. Yeah. And then when did you were you still doing? Did you start doing more of your own projects whilst doing your part two? Or yeah. How did how did the the studio emerge? So when I went back to do my part two, uh, the first year of my part two. Um, or after the the sort of two years in employment, the Fosters and Michaelis Boyd side of things, um, and also still trying to recover from the idea of like everything that comes with stress and anxiety, right? Mm. From riding the tube every day to yeah. going to meetings to going to social functions, all of those things. Like actually, my fourth year was horrendous. Mm. I didn't. I went to uni maybe four times in the whole year. I'm really surprised I didn't fail it, but I had a lot of support from one of the lecturers there. And um, and then it sort of dawned on me that like actually I had to control, I had to try and get a grip of what was going on and find yeah. out what was making all of these issues sort of come to light. And so I managed to get a grip on it. And then in so in fifth year, or just before going back into fifth year, so as we broke up for the summer um, after my fourth year, um, I basically applied for a position as a freelance sort of 3D modeling CAD technician uh, designer role at uh, a local artist studio. Um, and uh, I got called in for interview and uh, the artist is Comrade Shawcross. And so I was appointed by him as like one of his in-house freelancers. Uh, and so I was involved in projects that would have you know, small amounts of mechanical engineering, just purely by the way in which he designs and creates art. That's sort of where his, you know, art comes from, is the idea of like all of these, you know, all of this sort of, these components, whether they're mathematical or scientific, all sort of working together. And the best way to communicate that for him was through sort of mechanical sculptures. Right. Um, and uh, so I learned a lot from him. I worked for him for a year and a half in-house while studying part two so that's a cool which was pretty cool really great gig to have yeah. yeah so i was i was working for comrade like three days a week um when was this this was so this was during my fifth year but what what year was that roughly? uh so it would have been uh sort of 2013 okay yeah so 2013 and so so that was that the kind of era where he was doing the the, the sort of weaving machines or sort of so stuff? just after we right. did uh, one of the ones that I was involved in was the Royal Opera House uh, Kuka robots light display, which was quite interesting. Uh, and there was another one which was um, I think it was called Metamorphosis was that series using the Kuka robots, and we did one which was about carving an antler out of. Um, a block of oak or a pixelated block of oak and it was carving like this sort of stag's antler and it was all about this sort of dance between the robot and then this sort of organic wooden block which then sort of presented this antler mm. and so in the end we, we mapped out all of the CNC in, but using sort of 3D CNC in with the Kuka robot um, and spent me and Dave, the studio manager, we spent ages just trying to get our heads around how to make it work. Um, but it was really successful. We couldn't do the, uh, there were too many health and safety issues with doing the milling as part of the exhibition. So it was done in the studio and then um, the end the end of the sort of uh, drill bit or the sort of routering bit was then changed to like a, a light a um, little little LED light type thing and then the Kuka robot followed the same path as mm. it had done because obviously the finished product was the smallest it was going to be so the whole all of the history of the path of that cutting could just be turned into a data file that would allow it to do the same paths but without the risk of clashing with the uh, finished antler yeah so, which was really clever, and like so, uh, those sorts of things alongside me doing my fifth year, yeah, were just like really influential. And so, you know, the idea of using sort of CNC in and um, you know three uh, D modeling and animation and stuff like that and visualization, um, as well as looking at the sort of finer details, the technical details, and seeing the guys in the studio working on the sort of mechanical elements of it mm. uh, or even the lighting like how it was how it was sort of wired and the sort of um, 
uh, the boxes that they use and stuff, control boxes and stuff like that, was really interesting. So I was sort of exposed to that, which was great. And so also it was a different a different experience than being in a practice. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so I had that experience and then because we got on really well and because, like, he understood that I was doing architecture, then we sort of had this conversation which was that... Um, he wanted to do a big development on his warehouse and that development uh, he wanted to collaborate or basically be heavily involved with the design of it. So we came up with this sort of action plan which was like whilst I was in university then I would work for him as a freelancer a freelancer, and, and we'd do the planning permission and all the concept design and stuff like that. Uh, which he sort of drove basically and then um, as soon as we'd got planning and as soon as I'd sort of finished my part two then I would sort of remove myself from his employment and set up on my own as a sole trader um, and then collaborate with him as a designer on doing his warehouse which was just incredible like amazing very very this cool this is one of the most unusual stories of, of starting yeah. a business that's <laughs> kind of just kind of happened and just, just been kind of coming out of your own curiosity and and, and passion for, for making I think stuff. so. I think it's also important to have support from the people that you look up to in the industry. Yeah. So, like, you know, the idea... It's like, I, I, you know, it's one of the things. I don't agree with telling someone that you're their mentor. Like, I think that's, you know, that's just not something that I think is... I don't, I don't know, it doesn't come across as very genuine. It's like, I'm your mentor. It's like, because I want credit for being your mentor. That was not the relationship we had. The relationship that we had was very much like um, he appreciated the skills that I could bring to the table and I was, you know, really pleased to be in a position where I could offer those skills and work with someone that was doing so well within a sort of, you know, a discipline that was running parallel to architecture, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, obviously there's challenges when you work so closely with someone else who's within you know uh, a design discipline that has sort of like is has an ego to it which like all of us obviously understand um but like overall like you know the the proof is in the pudding so to speak we've got a finished building that's beautiful um and isn't this up in Clapton Pond isn't it? Yeah, yeah yeah near Clapton Pond yeah and uh you know it's his is his home it's his studio um it's got you know an amazing sort of fair face concrete basement that's like 160 square meters um the project was colossal yeah, and so like, no, this is not a small no, development this is, this is a... like no not at all and um it was yeah really interesting to be given that sort of responsibility and also be trusted with it and uh i learned a lot throughout that process even you know with just sort of making sure that the design team had enough people that understood the role that we would have to play within that process, you know, appointing uh, a fully qualified architect to be a part of the design team as a design consultant to take on the role of uh, what was the sort of CDM coordinator role back then, which has now changed to the principal designer. Um, so, you know, understand, understanding that and putting that sort of structure in place with the aid of comrades and then also sort of collaborating but ultimately you know sort of being at the mercy of comrade's decision because it's his home he's the yeah. client but he's also a collaborator so working really hard to convince comrade that certain things were designed in a certain way because they were the best way to be designed um was just a really sort of amazing process because it it made you have a lot more conviction in what you were doing mm. and understand that you needed to be able to communicate this perfectly because this guy is amazing in his own right and within his sort of mechanical sculptures and facades and things like that that he's been doing recently. Um, so if it's not amazing and there's not a really good justification behind it, then it's just going to fall flat on its face. Yeah. And there's just no point. It's just a waste of time. So that whole experience was amazing. It sort of reinforced my belief that what I'd picked up from Foster and Partners and Michaelis Boyd and even DOS Architects like as uh, during my part one, um, I could understand what I wanted from a practice um, and I understood that I did want to operate within architecture and not sort of filter into another discipline. Right, okay. Um, and uh, so then based on that relationship that lasted about three years, the projects from sort of start to finish, um, 
that were finished in yeah 2016 or end of 2015 2016 and uh, at that time I was living in Homerton um, which was obviously a super short commute <laughs> which is like a 10 minute walk to get to the studio so um, that was great and then that just basically made you know it reinforced my experience at part two uh, and my fifth year whilst sort of doing uh, the concept design stage with Conrad and the planning permission was hugely beneficial from that relationship because you know my, I ended up getting a distinction from a part two um, I got a 2-1 from a part one so you can obviously see the development in yeah. my understanding of the education side of things there and the course structure and what was re what was required um, but also like you know I remember that by Christmas so three months into the course or three months into our fifth year so our final year of part two I'd finished the bulk of my project and when I turned up to the crit and I had literally everything apart from a physical model the the reassuring thing was it was like well okay well you've got a lot of information already <laughs> can you now go further down the rabbit hole can you take this big idea and like really hone in on one element and then take that even further. So actually what my thesis ended up being, which was this idea of uh, populating uh, the Southern Sahara Desert with communication nodes that would basically allow uh, local traders to communicate far better and far more quickly mm. um, and in turn sort of help the economy in those areas like ended up being um, filtering past that or going past that and developing past that into being more about how these individual nodes were designed and then from those individual nodes how you could then allow communities to congregate around them so then it was like looking at locations of aquifers where are water sources what other projects are in the area that this could plug into like there was a project which was I think it was called like the Saharan uh, something like the Saharan Green Belt right. project which was I think there was like 13 nations that had got together and basically proposed that they were going to build a forest along the southern point of the Sahara Desert to stop desertification and to because obviously there's a massive issue and so I was like well let's plug this into that so it all became about like actually looking at real things that were going on and plugging this sort of hypothetical or sort of theoretical project into real projects that were already established themselves or had already established themselves. So like that just meant that my project just kept on going and that's why I was nominated for the uh, RIBA Silver President's Medal right. for my dissertation or for my thesis. So all of my experience through part one, the two years out, the working with Comrad, the then going on to work on his own studio development, all of that has contributed to me feeling confident enough to do my own thing. Yeah. Basically. Uh, which is obviously, it's quite interesting when you go to the pub with other guys or other people on the course and things like that, like, you know, a few years ago and say like how are you getting on and stuff like that and the questions are like how the hell are you doing this on your own because oh, I don't feel confident enough to manage a building or design a building and look into all the details and the contract and you know whether or not you can offer client accounts for procurement of items and things like this and I think what was quite interesting is when they were asking those questions I sort of realised then which was about sort of maybe a year and a half after I finished my part two, um, whilst I was at doing doing the work with Comrade, I was like, actually, yeah, like this is something that I could keep running with and see where I get to, Yeah, uh, basically. So, so what happened after the project with Conrad kind of wrapped up? Did you, was it easy to find new new projects, new clients? How were you, Um. so... How, how did you kind of like, you know, what sort of direction did you want to go in? Did you want to continue that unique path that you've kind of started mm. going down you know collaborating with uh, artists and that crossover discipline or yeah. 
or how did you how did you start to grow the business? Um, so I think immediately after the project with Conrad came to an end, um, I spoke to the architect that had been appointed uh, within the design team to see whether we wanted to collaborate on some stuff, um, and you know did a couple of sort of like fill in things like to try and help out with drawing deadlines because obviously he already had an established sort of clientele so to speak. Um, and so, you know, it actually, the roles reversed slightly where he was just like, oh, could you just help me with this deadline doing these drawings? Like, I need these drawings done for like demolition schedule or something mm. like that. Uh, so that I was just like, okay, so I felt quite secure then in just being freelance, essentially being like working from my flat, uh, or a coffee shop or something like that. And just being freelance and sort of dotting between jobs whenever I needed one. Um, and this was all around the time where we had, we were living in Homerton and we were like we identified quite quickly that we could turn our one bedroom local authority or ex local authority flat into a two bedroom with an open plan kitchen and so and we could do it on a budget of five grand <laughs> so we you know straight down IKEA gloss white kitchen um, we called it the Apple Mac kitchen because it literally had no handles on it and yeah. it was just and then so what we had after about six months of using it was just handprints people trying <laughs> to find where to push the button to open the door um, so yeah really poorly designed basically but um, it was one of those things where it created like a, a unique opportunity because there were I don't know probably 50 of these exact flats within the area and maybe more maybe more actually and um, they were all one beds and no one had converted one so we converted one and we got the permissions to do it from the freeholder and they were happy as Larry and so we converted it and did all of the building work on that put in the new kitchen did a new sort of it had a private garden as well and a parking space and a private entrance um, and uh, it was an absolute find but so we did it and uh, you know, it basically, when we then decided to put it on the market um, after four years of living there, um, it had doubled, over doubled in price. So, and it was when, it was when the Crossrail, we got into Homerton before Crossrail had come in to the Homerton station. So if it, in four years it had doubled in price? Yeah. Yeah, it was... And, and due, in part due to the work that you'd done on it. Yeah, yeah. well, I don't even think it was that, really. <laughs> I, th I think it was like, you know, it was... Um, I think there was one that sold down the road that was sold for about 80,000 less. Right. So we bought ours for £179,995. It was like every penny that we could scrub together. <laughs> there you go. That's what we need. And uh, and then when we left, we basically sold it for 10,000 more than we bought the three bedroom house in Forest Gate for. Right. So it was like 385 grand. So it was like it was crazy. Couldn't understand it at all. You know, speaking to the estate agents on the open house day where we had like 50 couples come through in a weekend and we were just like, this is crazy, like we can't, we can't charge people that. And their response was, well, actually, we're not going to say, we're just going to be like, look, do you want to put in an offer? It's roughly around this sort of value. And so we were getting offers that were like, yeah, like 30, 40, 50 grand over the asking price. Um, and so it was a bit of a weird one, but what it meant was it certainly it straight away unlocked the potential for us going right. Okay, well, now I've been freelance for longer. The banks will legitimise my earning capacity. Yeah. Same with my wife Christina. She's now freelance. So that was something that was a benefit because we'd been freelance for a few years. And um, so then we were like, right, well, okay, well, that's great. So what we can do is we can get a larger mortgage. And, and try and get as much as we can and then we can leave a pot of cash so that was what we basically after comrades had finished we set about this idea of buying a house in forest gate and um and doing it up which sort of led to a cork house being sort of developed really yeah um and then led to the idea of well if we can get a garden it has to be a garden long enough to put a studio in the bottom because part of like this holistic approach to setting up a practice would be that I'd work from home, we'd develop the home, I'd then continue to work from home whilst we develop the garden with an office, I'd then work from the office, I'd then be able to sort of welcome employees into the 
sort of ground floor of our house and office and garden. Yeah. And then when the projects were sustaining everyone's income and um, it was consistent and there weren't any sort of, you know, uh, peaks and troughs, so to speak, then I'd feel comfortable then to move out. And that's that's the position that we're in now. Amazing. Is that we're looking for premises to move out to. Amazing. Which and ha- is great. And, and how have you been able to sort of find those kind of projects? And, you know, obviously obviously we're here in the, in the courthouse and it's just like, it, it looks... Yeah, it looks can, so good. You can it, have a tour. It, 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 we're yeah. gonna have a little tour. And I'll stick it on the Instagram because it is. Yeah, yeah. It's just it's brilliant. Um, so how do you use this as a kind of like a tool for attracting new new clients? Yeah. And like, I mean, I'll, I'll imagine you show with someone around here, and they're like, seriously? Yeah, exactly. This is, this is what's possible in my in, you know my terrace <laughs> house in East yeah, London. Yeah, exactly. I think that's it. And I think the interesting thing was that the start of this when we finished the house. Um, we did. Uh, uh, I then decided to turn my sole trader freelance company into a limited company. Right. So I turned it into a limited company in 2017. We then worked out very quickly that financially for us it was best actually that that limited company stayed dormant for a year. Yeah. And then I still operated as a sole trader. And then when we then transfer over, we then basically I, I still practice as a sole trader alongside the limited company so that if there's something that's not really appropriate for the company, Ocker might be able to take it on as like a pro bono or like a reduced fee or just something interesting or for friends and family. But then anything that's like a serious project goes through the company. Right. So it's sort of like running those two things in parallel, which is really sensible for anyone that's a freelancer, but also as a company. What are, the, what are the benefits of that structure? Um, so the benefits of that structure that I'm aware of at the moment is it that means that you can retain as much profit in your company as possible. Okay. Because essentially what you're doing is you're earning an income from being a freelancer that is separate from a limited company. Right, and you're not draining money out of And you're of not it. draining money out of your limited company. So you can essentially, I can earn a salary that's as a freelance sole trader uh, for doing anything from designing like an interior of a bathroom or a bespoke chair or something like that that I wouldn't put through the company per se and then um, then the company is just primarily architectural projects um, which means then I can retain profit in that company I can still take a director's salary to top up my sole trader income um, but it also means that it's more sustainable because then the company and the company finances are responsible for paying employees. Um, they're responsible for investment in the company in order to get more business, marketing, PR, those sorts of things. Um, so you're not draining your own company's ability to manoeuvre. Yes. And so it sort of, actually what i found is it takes the pressure off. Mm. Because you're not sitting there going, well, this is my company and I'm actually taking a fat salary from it. What I actually do is I take, you know, a very small salary from it, like seven hundred pounds a month or something. Yeah, yeah. And that's just as a direct to salary. Anything else is dealt with at the end of the year in terms of dividends. Right. Um, and it's just a really common structure for a lot of other industries that that's how you would set up a limited company because you don't want to drain drain your resources. Um, and the more the resources you have, the more flexibility I have to get, you know people in for different projects um you know if i need to outsource something i can outsource something and it's not i'm not standing in the way of the company by taking a big paycheck yeah yeah it's it, it's, yeah, it's very sort of financially astute and sensible yeah. to do that and yeah. kind of a little bit like if you know if you were had if you had a job then you'd be kind of continuing getting your salary from yeah. your job and then you build it you limited you build up your company yeah on the side and kind of allow it yeah, to kind yeah, of exactly. grow and, and bring resources into it so, so what sorts of projects are you working on now? And okay. let's talk about um, part three yeah. as well. Because this, <laughs> this was one of the first things yeah. that we ended up actually talking about was, yes. was part three. And because you've, you've had this rather unique uh, experience, yeah. kind of like, you know, you've been doing your own thing and kind of just gone, gone for it and yeah. clearly extraordinarily talented and have a, a sort Thank of you. confidence <laughs> of being able to do and, and pull off and, you know, do these kind of incredible projects okay, yeah, yeah. now how how do we get this cross the line cross the line and and, and kind of accredited yeah. as, as an architect so i'll address the first point the, the the projects that we're getting now are 
the you know majority of them are residential in nature yeah um working really closely with some interesting clients like who actually want to be a part of the process they don't want to just wash their hands of it and let you do your job and like you talk to the builder and stuff like that they want to be involved in it and that's obviously quite an interesting dynamic anyway because you're supposed to be there to try and protect the interests of the client um and to protect their liability but then some clients just don't want that some clients actually want to be like thrown into the mix and i suppose as a professional you just have to uh, communicate what the risks are and make sure everyone's aware of them and you know it could come down to simple things like the clients wanting to get onto site whilst there's still a contractor on site so that they can decorate everything because they don't want to spend six seven grand on a decorator like they're they're real situations that happen on a lot of projects mm. and um you know so it's just sort of uh dealing with those types of things and working with those really interesting clients and working on sort of small scale and sort of medium scale residential projects uh, we have a couple of commercial projects one in particular that's on hold at the moment is a, a veterinary physiotherapy referral practice which essentially has like hydrotherapy tanks and stuff like that that's up in cambridge um, which we're looking forward to getting started on again, but it's uh, we just need to wait and find out where we are with it, really. So there's lots of like interesting projects, and those are the sorts of projects we're working on. But every project we take on has to have some form of like flexibility to the design. Like we want to understand from the client whether or not they want your stereotypical box on the back of your house, yeah, or whether they're going to allow us the freedom to explore what we personally think is best suited to their brief and if the clients are very much like no we just want we want to go larger homes six meters that's the boundary um and then we're just going to get a kitchen designer or go to heldens or something like that to design the whole interior layout then you know we're not interested in that because i don't think really i think you'd just be banging your head against a brick wall trying to communicate your value as a designer to that person yeah um and that's fine some people want that and that's absolutely fine but that's not sort of where we place ourselves so the projects and the clients that we work with allow us that flexibility and freedom to try and present stuff to them the same way as say for example the associate or senior partners at fosters did they would come and they would see these presentations that we'd spent like weeks doing or even a day doing mm. or whatever and uh, they would critique it and they would pull it apart and we would find the best solution for that project and it's the same process and if I get a hint that a client is going to be like that then I'm all for it like that's that's where I want to place myself really like someone that's personable someone that can sort of identify with where they are in their life maybe like a lot of our clients are like young professionals or young families like it's literally exactly where me and my wife are at the moment mm. so i think having that and being able to identify and also sympathize with some of the sort of constraints that come from those like budget um is there other ways of you know putting a positive spin on having a small budget so yes there's obviously ways of looking at material uh, construction method um, time on site whether you partly go with the main contractor whether you self build some of it like all of these sort of topics always come up with all of our stuff um, which is just really it just keeps it really interesting yeah. and it allows us to sort of provide as much value um, as we can for the fees that we charge, which has obviously been so really successful so far, which is great. And um, and and does the question of you being an architect, not being an architect, where is yeah. where, where 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 is that, and what where, where are you at in in getting your part three and some of the obstacles that you've encountered? Okay, so so basically the part three side of things, like I've I've not so much as put it off. It's just it's not. It's been something I've always wanted to do, yeah. But I've also got a very sort of um, you know practical approach to it, which is that I have a business. I've been setting up a business for the last few years, and because of that, I need to you know first and foremost protect the interests of my clients. I need yes. to deliver my projects on time. Yeah. Um, I need to make sure that I've got staff when I've got staff when I need it, and so that is the priority. Yeah. And so 
I, in building all of that, I've not felt like there was any point in me trying to engage in a part three at that time because, or over the last sort of five years really, because I just, I was in the middle of building something that was taking all of my time. And I just really just wanted to be really clear and practical about, you know, whatever I do within architecture, I'm trying to hold myself to the same standards as I would if I was fully qualified. And because of that, it sort of took the pressure off when I'd have to do it and or when I wanted to or needed to do it. And so with the client side of things, have they raised it? I think it's one of those things. It's like I don't you don't get asked whether you're fully qualified you just get asked, so can you do this job? And so I do take a very honest approach, which is like, well, yes, I can do this job. And if they ever refer or ask, or, you know, even with in all of my contracts, I never refer to myself as being an architect or anything like that. Um, it's always that I'm an architectural designer or a designer or, you know, those sorts of things. And I'm very honest about it, that the way in which the architectural education is structured means that I can't call myself an architect because even though I've got, you know, sort of 10 or 11 years worth of experience through education and working in practices and working for myself and being on site, uh, I haven't done the final part of the course, which means I can't call myself that so I won't and that's really simple like it's sort of really yeah. black and white for me yeah um and uh, so they ask you know if they ever ask or I usually volunteer it I sort of say when I meet someone um I always sort of I suppose cover my back really it's like I, I sort of meet and greet sit down chat with them and sort of say right well a little bit about me a little bit of a background and uh, so I've done this and I've done that, but I'm basically putting my final qualifications on hold because I'm building a company that I want to then convert into being an architect, a registered practice. Um, but I think that the most important thing is for me to establish like a clientele mm. and, uh, and a business structure first, and then I can look at actually becoming qualified. And so they, they don't see anything wrong with that approach and they they are very sort of pleased that I'm that honest about it yeah but it's quite interesting that the terminology is sort of it completely disappears on the clients after a while because they start to refer to you as their architect or this or that and after sort of four or five times of saying uh excuse me <laughs> by the way I'm not fully qualified they, they just, oh, we don't care, Richard, we know. Like, <laughs> and, that, and it's a really weird sort of idea to have. Like this, yeah, we know, but you're doing a great job and like we trust you and we know that you want to become one, so it's fine. Like it's that sort of conversation. And like as long as you can perform and you can do the job and you're doing all of the things that you would do if you were qualified, then obviously there's no risk well, for a client. It, it's quite interesting. I mean, there's no shortage of extraordinarily talented architects who have not been qualified as architects mm. for a long period of time. I mean, I've said to you before, when, when I was at Rogers, I mean, I, I think Mike Davies and Richard Rogers didn't get their part threes up until... Right. To right then in their late forties almost. So after Pompidou yeah. Centre, after right. after Lloyd's and yes. remember Mike Davies telling a story of, you know, presenting his part three stuff to uh, architects on and you know, his case study was Lloyd's and they were kinda of like, Wow, how did yeah. you get this this built? So it's an interesting situation to be in where it's like now you're you know, you you're running a business, it's up mm. and it's up and going, your priority is there. Yeah. And now to try and, you know, to to complete part three is gonna be no easy thing no. to do it you know whilst having you know your family life and all the other responsibilities you now yeah, yeah, yeah. you now have how has it been uh, what where are you doing your part three at the moment and how's it how's it been how what's the, the strategy basically so the first strategy was to just approach a couple of universities that are really like the look of to see whether they do it uh, frustratingly actually canterbury are they would just applied, I think, to get their part three course accredited because they didn't right. do a part three right. when I was down there. And um, and so I think that sort of added to me looking elsewhere. And so I started looking elsewhere and the initial sort of feedback I was getting was that you can't really do it if you're not in a practice. It's not 
practical. It doesn't meet the criteria. Um, lots of these sort of terms that you find on you know any website that sort of points you towards a part three. And so um, based on that, I just started doing my own research, speaking to like ex colleagues, uh, speaking to friends that are within architecture, and starting to figure out whether there's a way that you can have a similar sort of experience as what you would in practice but be more exposed to the things on site and being in charge of a project and actually sort of learn more from the part three because you are literally managing the whole project and you don't have anyone to answer to or protect you mm. and that that was sort of seemed really appealing to me just purely because of the way that I've approached everything through my career so far the idea that I'd be doing I'd be critiquing my own office with a case study that I was in charge of and I was being quite honest about everything to do with yeah. that project. I just found that quite interesting because like if you can't you can't be any more raw in that situation than that. Yeah. You know, if there's anything that's gone wrong, it's your fault. Yeah. And yeah. there's massive value to you and your business by doing yeah. that, having that reflective discipline. Exactly. Into your own exactly. Work. Yeah. And so I think, so when I started doing that, I then started to realize that, you know, little things like obviously when I set up the company and I started um, sort of practicing uh, and doing bigger projects and things like that, then obviously, you know, I, firmed up things like my company structure my insurance and things like that so when I was doing that I then started to research through the RIBA and the ARB what were the most sort of suitable insurance companies to go through which offered the most connection to the RIBA and the ARB so my insurance um, my professional indemnity insurance and anything like that is through uh, the RIBA sort of broker side of them um, and uh, my insurance is through AJ Gallagher um, which are represented by them so yeah. I think it's like I wanted to try and keep everything that I was doing professionally quite close to the two establishments that, or the two professional bodies that um, couldn't acknowledge that I was doing what I was doing because at the end of the day that's where I wanted to be so just because I've gone about it in a different way doesn't take away the fact that the end product is still the same yeah and so I started associating like everything like making sure that everything was either through the RIBA or they knew about it or it was a recommendation from them to appoint someone else um, i.e. the insurance company things like that to make sure that I was sort of really tidy with what I was doing and that there weren't any areas where someone could criticise what I was doing. Mm. Um, and so because of that, I decided to go and do my part three at the RIBA. So we've got a, uh, we're at the point now where we've got an intensive four day seminar up in Chester, um, which is our first sort of spring seminar so this is the RIBA Northwest yeah course. Right. Yeah, yeah yeah and so uh, it, everything's diverted up there so the course is through the RIBA but obviously their campus is uh, or their headquarters is up there so then they do it through Chester University so we're I'm going up there to do a four day intensive seminar uh, weekends uh, and there's two of them and then every month you get issued with your study packs and stuff like that. So I'm sort of running it. Now, the interesting thing about doing that is that the study packs and the sort of continued development and learning, that side of things is, is fine. Like I'm taking care of all of that. The place where it gets a bit grey is all about how you uh, record your experience. I don't have a mentor. I, d I, I haven't had one for six years seven years yeah so there's a huge amount of experience there that i am going to struggle to record in the way that they wish it to be recorded yeah and even with the sort of system which is the uh, certificate of professional experience it still requires it to be signed off by some form of professional mentor that is aware of all of the projects that you've been doing which in you know in an ideal world would exist, but it, it just doesn't mm. um, you know and so just because I have friends and colleagues that when we're down the pub I talk about what project I'm working on doesn't mean that they're in the office with us uh, day in day out. So the idea of a mentor doesn't exist to me, which is really difficult because to try and explain that 
and to try and find a way to you know record that experience so that your examiners or the people doing the interview later on down the line can actually critique your whole process and like any of your case studies requires someone to sign that off so at the moment it's still a bit of a gray area what are you, what are your options so at the moment the option is to do a certificate of professional experience for all of my experience up until a year before I would take the exam. So if I take the exam in October, say, then obviously I would do a certificate of professional experience up until October last year. And then from October last year, I would then do PDRs, um, quarterly PDRs for the year that I'm taking the course, which is fine in principle, but it still revolves around having a mentor. So I'm still trying to find out who will sign off the experience because the official sort of um, information or, or sort of guidance from any of the courses that I've spoken to is all about the idea that you've got maybe a tick boxing idea of, of uh, sort of making sure that everything's above board which is to get someone to shadow you so that they can understand what your projects are and your case study are is and then sign it off sign off your experience uh, for you to take time out of your business to go and shadow another architect from another practice um, in order to do a case study that someone is mentoring you or supposedly mentoring you um, to to uh, to uh, sorry <laughs> to, to um, employ a fully qualified architect within the studio that I tell them what I want them to do on a project by project basis so that they can then just look over my shoulder to see what I'm doing on a project by project basis to then certify that they have mentored me through it even though I'm employing them and paying them and by the way also that architect could potentially be someone that is newly qualified that has not had any site experience and so on and so forth so it seems a little bit oh, it's so contra- it's so bizarre yeah it's a bit bizarre isn't like you, it you might end up having to you know mm. hire somebody yeah pay them a salary mm. you're you're directing the projects you're yeah. you're in charge of your yeah. your projects but then they 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 are kind of signing off for mentoring yeah mentoring you what are your sort of reflections on on the way that this could be dealt with for other for other people facing this kind of yeah. this thing. I mean, and again, it's interesting as I said. I have spoken to a few other architects, and they do mm. tend to be very, you know, talented ones who are kind of you know you've gone off and you've set up your own business. Yeah. And the other question, I suppose, is why? Why do you? Why is it important to become an architect? Why not just say, this is a real compli- yeah. complication. Why I don't do I actually need it? Um, I think, like, for me personally, I think that I've realised over a a period of time over the last couple of years that there are certain, one, like, selfishly, there are certain opportunities that are not applicable to someone who is not fully qualified. And so there has been an example where I was interviewed to uh, be on a TV programme which was like a competition with clients and they choose which design uh, they wanted to take on and stuff like this. And... The interesting thing about that is that the interview went really, really well, but the last thing they had to check was with their insurance company about what the implications of having someone on the show who was not qualified when they're trying to promote the, um, you know, the sort of uh, trying to promote the idea or the um, the profession, I suppose, of architecture and being an architect and being fully qualified and and what that means for someone getting more value from a project and yeah. things like that. So it ended up being that I couldn't be a part of that discussion. I couldn't be a part of that show and I couldn't be on television um, uh, in that sort of environment because the idea that if I had won out over the qualified architect, then it would have given a negative impression of someone being fully qualified because they've just been beaten by this guy who's not fully qualified. And so that gives a negative impression of the industry, right? And so I was a bit like, well, I wouldn't have thought about it that way at all. And they were like, well, 
you know, it's it, it's just one of those things. Like we're trying to promote, rightly so, trying to promote the involvement of, in with architects within smaller residential projects, so that that we don't have like you know the issues that we have with um, overscaled developments, shanty town extensions, like all yeah. of those types of things um, within you know one of the most wealthy cities in the world, and um, and so based on that. They're trying to promote this positive idea or vision for architects being involved in those projects and adding value and they're more accessible. And I think that's true. That should be the case. But what's interesting is that it just, it must be quite fragile if you can't have a fully qualified architect being seen on a television show to the general public competing with someone that has essentially completed 80% of the same education as what the other person has um, but has just not gone through the final hurdle it must it seems like quite a fragile system if that's a worry yeah for people and like I'm I'm never going to turn around and say like you know my experience or the way that I've gone through architecture is better than anyone else's yeah um, there are things about people that have gone through a more traditional environment that or, or sort of structure that I envy, um, but then there are massive bonuses to wanting to do it on your own and wanting to learn and wanting to be. I, the word I use a lot with uh, friends and sort of colleagues and stuff is exposed. I like being exposed to things that you wouldn't be in practice because you're protected by certain people. And even if you are as high up as an associate, you have still got someone above you that is ultimately responsible. So, you know, your job is on the line, but you can get another job. Yeah. Being the person that's running a project and in charge of their own projects and in charge of their staff and in charge of their studio and their running costs and things like that, that I feel makes it very real and I feel like you develop a lot quicker. Yeah. Which is why I've had you know, had the sort of success that I've had so far and why I want to continue doing what I'm doing. It, it, and again, it's like, it's that ultimate responsibility yeah. where everything kind of comes down on you. And some people really thrive on that and it gets the best out of you. And yeah. I'm certainly, you know, that's why I love running a business because yeah. it's like everything is down to you. Yeah, exactly. And so it's kind of like, well, how does that, how can the, the professional uh, qualifications, how can it kind of start to accommodate yeah. that kind of thing? Do you have any thoughts on... On, on ways that might be better I think I think it's, it's one of those things that you've got to be quite careful about I suppose like there's every reason uh, for there to be the protection of the word architect there's every reason for that I firmly believe it that's why I want to become an architect I think it's a sensible approach I think it you know it avoids uh, certain issues from becoming bigger issues within the industry mm. um, and also it holds a lot of professionals to account right because they are monitored and so I think from my perspective though what I can see from my experience is that there has to be something that is like a almost like a gateway to that that's not education and it's not just professional practice um, or being a freelancer, that there's something that helps or guides you so that there is a, a sort of simpler transition from being maybe someone who has like an entrepreneurial mindset who wants to go on their own and do their own thing, but also has like the support of a registered or professional body that you can speak to and that you can liaise with about different um, issues that you might have on a project. But actually, like a, a bought-in system, a paid-in system, I'd, I would literally tomorrow, I would sign up. If there was a paid-in system that allowed me to have um, someone within a professional practice or someone that was fully qualified who was a, a sort of out-of-practice mentor, so to speak, and it happens in education all the while. Yeah. You know, where, like, you know, my dad was a head teacher. He paid for another head teacher to basically meet with him once a week every single week and go over all of the documents that he had to go through um, as a head teacher when he first became a head teacher. And he did that so that he could basically do what he wanted to do and be a head teacher, but also feel like there was a support network there that he felt like he had bought into 
and he said that was really successful. So applying something like that to architecture, where if you decide after part one or part two, or whatever point in your sort of architectural career, mm. you decide to sort of deviate from this traditional path, then it would be really sensible to in, instead of let those people sort of get lost uh, outside of the system to try and um, help guide them or support them through whatever they want to do within architecture and just make sure that there aren't, you know, they're not overstepping the boundaries. They're not practicing something irresponsibly. They're not putting their clients at risk. Like that sort of level of, uh, sort of support and understanding and um, sort of professionalism that comes with being a registered architect, applying that to someone that is part one or part two, you know, would then sort of empower people to maybe think, well, I know that I have to go back to uni to do my part two, but I might start sort of engaging with people more in set design. I might take on really small projects that I can get my teeth into and understand more about like how a construction site works but ultimately know that I've got some support there. Yeah. Um, and I think if, if you went that route, I think you'd have to start talking about the potential for a license to practice architecture rather than just having the term architect yeah. be, a, be an all or nothing scenario. And I think like the license to practice architecture is a really interesting concept because what it allows you to do is it allows you to prove to your clients that you are part of a professional body and you have a license to engage in professional practice within architecture and you are still learning and you're still studying if you decide to go back and do your part two uh, and you are still on the path to becoming a fully qualified architect but it doesn't always the traditional structure of in practice mentoring doesn't always suit everyone and it seems silly that like if I wasn't so resilient within the industry to sort of get it done but in my own time and not sort of shy away from any of these challenges it seems silly that I would have been one of the ones that had fallen by the wayside and sort of gone off into the sort of the direction of I'm um, a designer yeah you know a multidisciplinary designer that also dabbles in architecture and I'm not governed by anyone. I don't answer to anyone. Like that's just what I do as a business, and uh, I think it's a shame because what that means is, is although that's absolutely fine, um, it means that the RIBA and the ARB lose out on a really decent representative of their professional body just purely because they can't adapt to different scenarios of how people engage yeah. within architecture. Yeah. Brilliant. I mean, I think that's a good a good point to to wrap up there. Yeah. And it really like, you know, extraordinary career that you've had so far. Thank really, you very re much. Really inspiring, and I love you know in, you know I, I want to keep in touch and definitely hear how how the rest of it unfolds and where you go next. So thank Perfect. you so much for your time on the show. Not a problem. Pleasure. Thank Excellent. you. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15-minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you be unstoppable.